Well, every environment has its own challenges, but uh, to create st a stable and prosperous so society and jobs, every company and every society needs to go through this change from being an industrial age model to being a model appropriate for the network world. And those that don't are tending to fall behind or disappear. So I'm not arguing in, in favor of um, lack of stability. I'm arguing that we need to do this to create uh, a sustainable and prosperous world. For sure, entrepreneurship is key to everybody. Um, it's key to jobs. 80% of new jobs come from companies that are five years old or less. And innovation is what drives every institution in the society. Um, so th there's a problem though. How do we find funding for entrepreneurship and for startups? And right now the big banks are not lending money because they have all these toxic assets on their balance sheets. And uh, so we need to get these toxic assets into a commons whereby we can bring the world's leading modelers together. And in macroeconomics, we talk about the open models corporation that's doing that. When it comes to investing in new companies, um, venture capital is broken too. As uh, venture capitalists now are basically not investing because um, the size of the investment required is so small that they are just overwhelmed weirdly with opportunities and they can't really identify and screen these opportunities and they can't keep an eye on the companies they invest in. So we need to move towards a collaborative model of venture capital. In the book we talk about Vencor, which is essentially mass collaboration being applied to venture capital. And could that involve government in some way as well then? Sure, absolutely. Right now I'm pitching the White House that the President should be the curator of a whole series of challenges trying to stimulate entrepreneurship in the United States. Rather than just talking about it, um, actually doing something about it and using the internet to um, bring all kinds of fabulous companies to the fore whereby they could get attention and get investments. Well tonight I'm going to be um, talking about the transformation of our societies as we go from an industrial age to an age of networked intelligence. And uh, because this, the, my host tonight is, um, is uh, Grupo uh, TV uh, One, I, they're a media company. And so I'm going to be focusing on many of the issues having to do with the reinvention of the media, the reinvention of marketing and advertising. Uh, into a number of It's ways. no longer just mass. It's sort of become molecular media, mm. if you like. And, uh, but mass media was part of the industrial age, you know. It started with a printing press, radio, television, broadcast technology. And like mass production and mass education and uh, mass democracy and mass marketing and so on, they were all controlled one way, one to many models where the people out there were relatively passive consumers. They were an audience. And now, of course, with the new media, that's the inner, inner, uh, it's the antithesis of all of that. It's it's one to one and many to many. It's highly interactive. It's uh, it's not controllable, and it's not an audience. They're 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 users. They're actors. They're initiators, and they can collaborate. So this changes everything, and sure changes everything having to do with marketing. That's the sort of tip of the iceberg, basically. Yeah. I think the way I describe television and macroeconomics is that it's becoming this really cool app. TV is a, an app um, on the network. And we've been saying this for 15 years, that the internet would eventually eat television. Invasive. Well, you do need broadband uh, to make that happen. And which is why closing the digital divide should be a key policy of any government in an emerging economy. But once you have that, then the model that you described is the right one my point of view. Same for music. Hmm. I mean, what we need is what I've called for many years everywhere internet audio where, you know, for three American dollars you get per month, you get streamed to you any song ever recorded on any device, your mobile device, your home stereo, your car, whatever. And this de eliminates the whole issue of intellectual property, the whole issue of theft of IP. No one's going to steal the song. Why would you take possession of the song? 
if you can have it streamed to you anytime you want it. Mm. You know, who steals YouTube videos? You know, because you can access them anytime you want. So, uh, and the same thing is true for mu uh, movies. And then what happens is, if the movie industry is smart, they'll do what the record industry didn't do. They'll take all of their content, place it in a big uh, exchange, and use actual economics to divvy up the money. So I watch a movie, and uh, so a, a, you know, a, a few cents or dollars or what, whatever is appropriate goes to the provider of that uh, uh, film. Just like I listen to the Rolling Stones, can't get no satisfaction. A few micro cents ought to go to Mick Jagger. But the record industry didn't do this, and they're the canary in the mine shaft. I mean, the industry that brought you Elvis and the Beatles is now suing children, is hated by its customers, and it's collapsed. You know what? It deserves to collapse because it viewed the, the internet as a threat rather than the best thing that ever happened to it. It took a legal solution to a business model problem. Don't fix that with stronger copyright laws or more police. You fix that by having business model innovations. I mean, let, let's take the record industry because it's the one that's farthest along in its collapse from an industrial age model. Um, you know, the, the record industry wasn't that profitable prior to the internet because it had this bloated distribution channel made of atoms. You made CDs made of atoms and you put them into trucks made of atoms and ship them to stores made of atoms with shelves made of atoms and, and, and so the record industry could only bet on home run hitters because one of 20 would be profitable. You could never bet on a bunter so there's some great little um, you know band in, in uh, Brazil that plays uh, whatever you know Brazilian music or salsa or mariachi or whatever that's never going to get a recording contract because the market isn't big enough. They can only bunt, to use a baseball analogy, they can't hit home runs. Mm. So that was bad for musicians, because it means that that little band would never get a recording, recording contract. It was bad for music lovers, because we never got to have the choice to have that bad. And it was banned for the rec bad for the record industry, because um, they were not profitable. Along comes the internet, it eliminates all of those costs to zero. All they had to do was change music from being a product to being a service, and the issue of intellectual property vanishes. Mm. But they didn't do that. So I think that we have these knee-jerk reactions around intellectual property. We look for quick fix sort of legal enforcement solutions when we need to do the right thing for, for business, for the economy, and for society as a whole, and change our whole model from an industrial age one to a network. Well, this is a big issue. It's actually three issues. Transparency, privacy, and security. And all three are different. They're related, but they're different. Sony had a security violation and lost um, its, its uh, control over private information, which resulted in a privacy violation of individuals. Um, transparency is something different again. It's the opportunity and the obligation of companies like Sony to be more open and to communicate pertinent information to their customers, their employees, their business partners, the communities within which they operate, and to their shareholders. But it's possible to be a transparency advocate and also to be a privacy advocate because privacy is for individuals and to also be a security advocate because companies and governments should be secure. Um, they should not have invasions uh, that undermine um, their, their right to have secret information and to protect private information. So I wrote a book about transparency called The Naked Corporation, saying this is a great thing. I wrote a book about privacy, saying privacy is a basic human right. You have to fight to defend it, and companies should take steps to make sure that information is private. I haven't written a book about security, but it's the underlying uh, technology uh, force for all of this. But this is very muddled. You know, people like um, some of the Facebook people argue the transparency is not only an opportunity for individuals, or sorry, for institutions, it's an opportunity for individuals that if we're all more open and share all this information about our personal lives, that will make us better people. We won't cheat on our spouses and so on. This is a very dangerous idea because privacy is a, 
foundation of a free society. I mean, I think there are thousands of young people this year who won't get that dream job. Mm. It's all looking good, and then they failed the reference check. You know, where their employees, employers went onto Facebook and you know found something inappropriate that they were doing when they were young. Well, people do inappropriate things when they're young, and it shouldn't be held against them. And for sure, but they, but it will be. So parents need to tell their teenagers, don't be giving away so much stuff. I know it's an extraordinary thing. Will anyone ever be elected as president ever again? Yeah, exactly. Politicians will always be able to go back 15 or 20 yeah. years and see what they were doing at college. Yeah, and there they were, drinking underage, wearing a dress <laughs> as a rugby player, you know, or something. <laughs> I, we're hitting it. Um, I think that they're entering the workforce, the marketplace, society, they're becoming citizens, they're voting, and there's no more powerful force change every institution. Uh, exhibit A, Obama got elected because of that generation. Uh, exhibit B, Tunisia. Exhibit C, Egypt. Uh, should I go on? You know, they're, they're a, a revolutionary force. And I use that word advisedly. You know, everyone talks about there are revolutions in this and revolutions in that. Today there's a revolution in revolutions. Used to be revolutions had leaders in a vanguard that brought the masses to power or brought them to power. Well, now you have these peer to peer revolutions or wiki revolutions, as I call them, where the internet drops the cost of transactions and collaboration, not just for innovation and wealth creation or for creating public value, but for dissent and rebellion and even for the conquest of power. So, this is a a very unusual time in human history. And one thing for sure, it's going to be tough to be a tyrant over the next period. 